A good piano teacher can spot it a mile away. They know when it's coming. The crash upon the keys. Versus use of the upper body, release of the arms for a warm, rich sound. So we want to use the body to cushion our sound. Where the wrist goes, the arm will follow. Well, hi there. Welcome back to my channel. <laughs> I'm Penny, and in this video, we're talking piano technique. That's right. Use of the body in pursuit of the production of beautiful tone. And I'm sitting with the camera in front of me today rather than in my practice room with a side view as usual because I wanted to show you some of the things that I'm doing physically with my arms. So one of the things to keep in mind is that the keyboard, uh, when we land on it, it it's an attack, right? It, it's a blow. It's, it's, it's a landing. And we want to cushion that landing as much as possible. Just like on a bicycle or a good car would have shock absorbers, right? So that every bump you go over doesn't give you a, you know, a broken back. And at the piano, we want to create minute movements with our wrists and arms that will help to absorb the impact of that blow, of that forceful landing on the keys. Well, it's Editing Penny here, and I've got a book by Joseph Levine called Basic Principles in Piano Forte Playing, and he's talking about the exact same thing, the wrists as shock absorbers and how you must use your upper body, your back muscles, for the production of good tone. Let me share some of what he has to say. Then we have under the heading Natural Shock Absorbers. Why no noise? Because Rubinstein's wrists were always free from stiffness in such passages, and he took advantage of the natural shock absorber at the wrist, which we all possess. And it's um, no surprise that some of the most harsh, aggressive, <laughs> crash-tastic, as I like to say, sounds occur when we're playing loudly. When, let's say, we begin uh, something like the pathetic sonata of Beethoven, which begins with a big C minor chord. Uh, the second partita of Bach, first movement, also begins with a C minor chord, right? Those, uh, those are very brilliant, bold ways to begin a piece. And so many of the time I see and hear that they approach these beginnings of pieces with a very stiff arm. And bless their heart, they're very well-intentioned. They love the music to death. They probably put their, <laughs> their sheet music under their pillow uh, when they go to bed at night. But for lack of a little bit of use of the arm in an effective way, they're creating some very loud and, and aggressive sounds. And here's a crash-tastic performance of the opening from that C minor partita by Bach. And here's the same passage played with releasing of the arms. So we want to use the body to cushion our sound. Imagine then that your wrists are working as shock absorbers so that when you go to play loudly, it's a full, warm, loud sound and not a crashing, uh, harsh, aggressive, pointed sound. And you can do this in a chair. You don't even need to be at your piano, right? Now, I'm sitting uh, on the front. You can see my, my chair here, right? I'm sitting basically on the front, you know, palms width of the chair. I'm sitting pretty close to the edge because I want m my legs, my uh, quads, I guess they're called, <laughs> my big leg muscles to be free and mobile. That helps me to feel my sitting bone, which I can kind of move front and back on. So you got your posture there and you want a slight little forward bow so you're not sitting totally upright. I do tend to move 
forward quite a bit. I don't recommend that for you. I've been playing a long time. This is what works for me. And as I was telling someone recently, I don't go through my entire day <laughs> in the posture that I am when I'm playing box music. It's really only when I'm in the thick of the most intense performance moments that I'm really kind of quote unquote hunched over. But it's not hunched over. Kind of like a, a speed skater is what I was telling someone recently. Um, speed skaters, they really bend over, you know, but they don't go through their entire day and their entire training session like that, you know, <laughs> but that's the position they need to be in for the race in order to get maximum speed and uh, aerodynamics kind of thing. So it's the same f at the piano. Yeah, so that picture of Anton Rubinstein that you see, he says, but this sketch is Rubinstein as I knew him. Notice that instead of sitting bolt upright, as the pictures in most instruction books would have the pupils do, he is inclined decidedly toward the keyboard, sitting slightly forward. So as a starting uh, image to keep in your mind, just kind of imagine that you are in a pool of water. Maybe you're standing in the shallow end, just the water is like up to your shoulders kind of thing, uh, or your chest. And you're just pushing the water away, both hands starting together and then pushing out. You're pushing down a little bit and then out, this kind of motion. Or maybe you could imagine that you have a little sa uh, sandbox in front of you and you're, you're kind of digging a little bit of a hole. You're a little, a little puppy dog digging in its sandbox. Not like clawing like this or anything. Just gentle, light sand at the beach, right? Or maybe you're dusting some, uh, some of that sand that got on your picnic table lunch, and you're just dusting it off. The point here is that the arms are releasing away from the body and not like this starting in the center and pushing out this kind of motion. So you can start with that because, as I say, a lot of students tend to play from the elbow. They slap on the key from the elbow where the, the upper arm is locked against the upper body and they're throwing from the elbow. And they figure they can get quite a good, powerful sound that way. And in fact, they can. But the problem is, even though it's powerful, it's not pleasing, at least not to my ears. Crash-tastic, as I like to call it. So to warm up your sound, still have it be powerful, still very loud and full, yes, but with volume to it. Full, full voluptuous sounds are what we want uh, when we have to play a big chord. Here's another clincher for what the wrists can do. Rubinstein did not pound down upon the keyboard, but communicated his natural arm and shoulder weight to it. There is a vast difference between the ordinary amateur hammering on the keyboard for force and the more artistic means of drawing the tone from the piano by weight or pressure properly controlled or administered. This is exactly what we were talking about, in, away from the piano, how we use the body. Big chords are not the only thing that we're uh, applying this kind of motion to. I'm just using that as an entry point because the loud chords are usually where we see the, the most offense to the ears. <laughs> we don't want to assault the listener. They pay good money to hear us. <laughs> or they pay good money for their YouTube premium account, right? We want to give them as, as most pleasing a sound on the piano as possible. So the treading the water or the digging in your little sandbox, the arm, it, the upper arm that is, is gently moving away from the body. In relation to the hand and the wrist, there's a, there's a kind of a snake-like, you know, zigzag kind of shape. It's this kind of thing. Forgive me, I have to look over here at my monitor to see that I'm showing. The left hand, which is a mirror of the right, right? So then the left hand is moving in a, I have to think, clockwise direction. 
let's just ignore the, the upper arm for a moment and focus on the hand itself. This is called the bridge of the hand, right? At which generally you want to have supported nicely by curved fingers. Although flat fingers are very essential when you want to create a uh, really beautiful legato quality, especially in some of the more pianistic repertoire like Chopin, Rachmaninoff, uh, this kind of thing. Um, it is almost an axiom to say that the smaller the surface of the first joint of the finger touching the key, the harder and blunter the tone. The larger the surface, the more ringing and singing the tone. Naturally, if you find a passage requiring a very brilliant, brittle tone, you employ a small, striking surface using only the tips of the fingers. Um, but f f curved fingers are very... We use that uh, probably most of the time in box music because it gives good clarity. But if we use the curved fingers alone... It would not be, it might be clear playing, but it would not be also warm and voluptuous. We want the sound to be like honey on the eardrum, like just so sweet, right? And again, that comes from use of the rest of the body. So if you can just try to free up your wrist joint, imagine that your wrist is making a sphere type shape, a very squatty circle. So the left wrist, then, will be moving in a clockwise fashion, moving away from the body. The right hand, which is a mirror of the left, will be moving in a counterclockwise direction. Even if I'm not actually doing anything for my arm, I'm just focused on the wrist, the it, it's, it's a sure sign. You can't stop it. <laughs> the rest of the arm will follow. Where the wrist goes, <laughs> the arm will follow, right? And uh, with Bach's music, as we said, clarity of voicing is so essential. So we can hear all of those two, three, four, or even five voices simultaneously weaving in and out of the texture with great independence and brilliance of touch and tone, sparklingly clear. At least that's what I love about box music, and it's what I try very hard for when I'm practicing. And I do plan to make a lot more tutorials because I've uh, been having some doubts about how I can explain things. So I'm trying, you know, we're all trying to work through our weaknesses. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that is on my agenda to try to show these things. But this, this idea of the hands and the wrist, especially moving in that circular direction away from the body, just try that right now or pause the video, try it a few times. And I am exaggerating these gestures a great deal. You know, <laughs> if I were moving this much at the piano, <laughs> I, I would lose contact with the keyboard, right? But it's important to exaggerate the gestures so that the body can be trained to remember what it's supposed to do. It's like choreography for a dancer I suppose they map it out on paper and they d and then they go very slowly not focused on the details but just sort of the the broad strokes the, the big picture and then getting into the micro details of it all it's the same thing with piano playing and good technique right and through all of this I'm bowed slightly forward I'm not I'm not upright because if you're playing totally upright at a 90 degree angle, you're not able to take advantage of the big arm muscles, like your biceps. And my teacher, Constance Keen, <laughs> she was only, what, five foot two? And I was one of her last students. She was in her 80s when I worked with her. But even then, she still got a big sound out of the instrument. And she would tell me at lessons, uh, use your back muscles. My previous teacher at the Eastman School of Music was always talking about rotation of the wrist and a weight transfer of the forearm and having the upper arm follow suit. All of these things, he focused a lot on the uh, energy of the f f first joints of the fingers. Very detailed, physical, minute movements. 
And but as I say, Constance Keen, uh, she <laughs> she used to say, use your back muscles. I don't remember my other teacher ever mentioning back muscles. But uh, between the two of them, that was a lot of wonderful advice. And it's so true. You have to use your back muscles. Because let's face it, what is the most comfortable thing to do when we're tired? Let's say you've been you've been working at your day job. Maybe you maybe you're an office administrator and you work 8 hours a day, sometimes longer because you have extra shifts or a busy season. And uh, I remember working at Steinway and sometimes I'd put in these 10-hour days and then just like sitting at a desk at a computer all day. Oh my gosh. Then you get home, maybe you have your walk, you get your groceries, you do your chores, and then what do you want to do? You just want to flop on the couch, right? We want to be careful that as comfortable as it is to just flop on the keyboard with your dead weight, <laughs> it's not helpful for the production of a good tone. We want to communicate something through the sound. And while we will have plenty of uglies and unwanted sounds during the course of our practice of, with a piece, we always must have in our idea the the vision of the ultimate performance. Always have that vision of what is the ideal way that, that I want to play this piece. And, and that, of course, is to make something expressive and to not assault the listener's ears or not assault your own ears. Maybe you're not even noticing that your sound is crash-tastic and, and aggressive. That is possible. I think it's the case with a lot of students. We live in such a noisy world to begin with. There's so many machines and engines. Things are loud in general, much louder. You, can you imagine uh, in, in Bach's time, what sounds would he have heard? What would be the loudest sound other than the organ that he was playing, right? When all 10 kids were coughing with the cold, I suppose that would be loud, right? Or the church bells would be loud. But really, there's not. there weren't many loud sounds. There wasn't a whole lot of noise. We've, we're past the machine age. We got a lot of noise. We're used to it. So factor that in. There was a wonderful quote, and I did a short about this uh, a few months ago. Um, Alfred Cortot, a, a fine pianist, he used to, uh, so I got this from a, a book by one of his students. He, he would say, uh, you, you would never talk to your, your sweetheart or your, your love, your true love, <laughs> with the same tone of voice as you would ordering a sack of potatoes, <laughs> right? Think of these things. They're very helpful in the preparation of tone production at the piano. How would you speak to your pet, your, your beloved little puppy? How would you speak to your, your child, your baby? Um, your elderly relative in the nursing home, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go in and say, hey, I, how's, how's that sore leg of yours, eh? You, you know, you, you show some expression, some care. Oh, are you feeling okay today? You know, you change your voice. We're so good at doing that. We're so good at modulating, most of us, I think. <laughs> it just comes naturally to us to change our tone of voice for the setting. And then if we are in fact ordering a, s a sack of potatoes, like Alfred Corto says, we don't say, oh, can I have a sack of potatoes, please? No, we say, hey, give me a sack of potatoes, right? We've got to shout it out, right? There's very little tenderness when you're asking to order whatever product it is, you know, as opposed to speaking tenderly to someone you care deeply about. So we want to think about that, but that is kind of misleading because at the piano, uh, we can still play with warmth and tenderness, but yet also loudly and with power and brilliance. And so that is where careful use of the body comes in. So we're going back to these, uh, this little bit of rotation from the wrist and the bridge of the hand where the rest of the arm follows and it makes a wave. It's a little bit of a zigzag, right? I do this all the time in my playing. Right hand, same thing. Let's say I'm gonna start the C minor partita, which starts with that chord. 
Yum! Bum, bum, ba-dum. Bum, bum, ba-dum. Bum, yum, ba-da-dum, ba-dum. On each of those big chords, I am coming down on the key when I'm in the air. It's hard to explain these things. Um, when I'm in the air, my wrists are up, upwards, and my hand is hanging down. When you're about to play a chord, a big, a big chord, or even a not so loud chord, um, try to be in the air a little bit above the key with hands loose as though you're like they're wet and you're shaking your fingers to dry. And notice that at that point, when you're above the key, getting ready to descend, the upper arm is close to the body. But we want to uh, ignite our piano shock absorbers <laughs> to, uh, to uh, absorb the impact of the blow. So you land on the key. That's where that rotation uh, kicks in. As soon as you land... The wrists do their rotating away from the body, and the forearm and the upper arm follow. And when you're landing like that, the wrist, which was kind of up, upwards, and the fingers dangling naturally, again, like, you're, like they're wet and you're just letting your fingers air dry, right? But when you land on the key, then the wrist can bend the other way, downward, below the keys. As you begin to come out of the keyboard and to really uh, kick in those shock absorbers, that's where the rotation comes in and the wrist resumes more of a position that's parallel to the keys. This kind of thing. Try to get comfortable with having some of these movements. My goodness, would you, would you move your wrist in this fashion in the middle of a fast, pa fast passage? Of course not. That would be ridiculous. But slow practice? Uh, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> right? Now, that th these things, as I say, help to produce good tone quality, a warm sound. They help to guard against crashing and banging the piano. Oh, it's amazing. When played, I suppose this is the case with any instrument, when played well, it can be the most beautiful sound in the world. When played even just moderately poorly, it can be downright painful to listen to, especially for hours on end. It doesn't seem to bother some people. I don't know, maybe I have more sensitive ears. But this idea of using your voice and how we modulate our voice based on what we want to say is a very good analogy to use at the piano. The other thing, uh, the finger position too. I see a student sometime play with almost pencil fingers. I don't know how they manage. You want to avoid pencil fingers as well as floppy <laughs> kind of fingers, right? So curved, right? Firm and curved, but everything else loose. So when you're doing this exercise just at your kitchen chair, you don't even need your instrument for this. You could sit on your bed, for goodness sake, prop your teddy bear up next to you. Hey, teddy, let's work on our technique, right? Do it on the bus as you're coming home. It's very helpful. Because so much of the time, that crashful, forceful, harsh, aggressive playing that is absolutely painful and cringeworthy, despite the student's best efforts, that's what it sounds like, that can be allevi alleviated not only by releasing the upper arm, as we were talking about, having good rotation from your wrist away from the body, but also letting your arms swing one after the other. Now we see a chord, three notes in the right hand, maybe two notes in the left hand. They're supposed to be played at the same time. Okay, boom, both hands are totally in sync. Right, that's how it's written on the page. But if you're suffering from tension in your arm, perhaps in your wrist, I fortunately do not. I fortunately do not. I think I've, it's largely from the, the excellent training that I've had as well, um, just doing a lot of stretches and getting, getting exercise. 
Uh, deep breathing, too, can help, I think. Uh, but I always stretch before I play. Um, but not everyone is uh, fortunate enough to be pain-free at the piano. And so regardless of how you want your playing to sound, your stiffness and tension, I think, now I'm not, I mean, I have a doctoral degree, but I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a piano doctor, I guess you can say. Um, I'm not a medical doctor, right? So I, if you have serious pain at the piano, you please s don't play through the pain. Uh, get some professional medical help. Certainly, by all means, uh, your health comes first. If you can, uh, try to incorporate into your, play your playing, your practicing, some asynchronization of hands, even if it's just on your lap in a chair like now. If you think about how we walk, when we walk, right, we swing our arms side to side. We don't walk with both arms in sync. It's a little bit of an unnatural concept for, for both hands to go down to play a chord. A long, long time ago, many players would play the left and then the right slightly delayed. That became a little bit, uh, or a lot, <laughs> taboo after the world wars, um, and certainly not a lot of players do it anymore. I do a lot of it myself. I try to keep it to a, mod a modest amount, but even if you're not doing it for a musical reason, you can be doing it for a physical reason. It feels good to play left, right, left, right, left, right, and it will help to free up your upper body, especially your back muscles. Again, keep your, keep your fingers curved and firm because if everything is all wobbly, you might as well be flopping on the couch like at the end of your busy work day. But this kind of thing. And again, I'm still sitting on the very front of the chair and my legs close together. You know, uh, if you're playing, uh, I don't know, ragtime or some, you know, pop rock, you can sit with your legs kind of far apart and, you know, maybe stomp your foot. But when you're playing classical music... Uh, sit with your knees f close together. You want to have both feet on the pedals at all times, even if you're not using both pedals. And all of those things, provided you're sitting on the front of your bench with that slight forward bow, all of that creates uh, maximum uh, agility and uh, ease of movement. You know, the keyboard is five feet long, 60 inches, right? And we have to be able to get from top to bottom. Um, try to th I like to think of this playing space. I mean, most of the time we don't use the extreme notes at the top and the bottom. We use the central notes, especially in Bach, <laughs> you know. Um, I think of that as a kind of like, like a, a crystal ball, like a fortune teller would have a crystal ball. Like it's like a, a magic spot, right? There's, there's energy there, right? If you're touching that, that magic crystal ball, or you're even just a few inches from it, there's like a, an aura that comes out of it. I try to think of the piano as being like that. And anything that's over there or on the floor or over here is out of that aura, it, it, it's like a hot zone. It's electricity. Like there's, there's so much room to capitalize. That's, that's valuable, precious space. So be mindful of that too. But this asynchronization of hands can really do wonders. I wonder if you can uh, think of a reason other than helping to relax the arms where asynchronization of hands could be effective. What could it help with? Notice, it's always left, right, left, right. What does that allow us to do? It allows us to project the tops, the right hand, the tops. If you have a, a, a note at the top of your chord, or maybe, maybe you're, you're playing a fugue, and there's a subject entry, or you're coming upon a cadence, like a cadential arrival, or a new entry of a subject, anything that's like musical equivalent to a new paragraph in, a new, in an essay, something that you want to enunciate and bring out, especially if it's a top note of a chord, this 
asynchronization of hands, just a slight bit of that will help that note in the top to sparkle. My teacher, uh, Constance Keene at Manhattan School of Music, uh, she was trained by Abram Chasens, um, and he was a student of Joseph Hoffman. Hoffman was a student of Anton Rubinstein. She also had training through um, Lauda Mills Huff, uh, who was a student of Theodore Leschetizky, and and she knew Arthur Rubinstein and Vladimir Horowitz and Van Cliburn and you know so she was very well versed in the different styles of playing, and her motto was tops tops tops. She loved to bringing out the tops, and of course she was known for playing Rachmaninoff's music, the Preludes especially, and that music is certainly incredibly uh, well suited to bringing out the tops. Now, she didn't tell me to, do, to go asynchronizing your hands, but it was bring out the tops by way of a strong uh, finger and continuous application of pressure to the key after, the, after you're actually on the key. We think, okay, I've played the key. That, that note's over and done with. Well, maybe, maybe so if it's a short note, but if it's a long note or a melodic note, keep applying pressure to it as you're on the key. Rachmaninoff used to do that a lot. And my teacher had a chance to hear Rachman, Rachmaninoff perform at Carnegie Hall. He died in the early 1940s. So I don't know when this would have been, probably the 30s. But can you imagine that? Oh, she would have been a teenager, I'm sure. Uh, I remember asking her, Miss Keen, what do you remember about hearing Rachmaninoff? And because she said uh, the Carnegie Hall was all sold out and they had seating on stage and that's where she was. I wouldn't be surprised if her teacher, Abram Chasens, uh, was able to get her that ticket. But anyway, she says, uh, I just remember he had new shoes on and they squeaked when he walked out on stage. <laughs> uh, but that's something he did. Continuous application of pressure from the finger on the key after it had been struck. These are all things to file away. The asynchronization of hands was something that I picked up on when I was researching for my dissertation, and I wrote that ta uh, paper on Ignacy Jan Paderewski, the great Polish pianist from uh, the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And he does a lot of that. Boom, boom, left, right, left, right. Much of the time, it's too much. Vladimir de Pachman, same thing. Now, I don't suggest you do anything like that unless you want to. But I think that even if you're not having trouble with arm tension, because as I saw, this can really help with that, uh, you can benefit from some asynchronization of hands at the piano. Here's a little bit of the aria from the Goldberg Variations, practiced very slowly with lots of asynchronization of hands. This is how I practice that piece much of the time. And here's more of a proper performance of that same section. You can still hear that I use a little bit of the asynchronization of hands. I really like it for warming up the sound and creating a beautiful singing tone. And here's one more example for you. I'm going to play the opening from the beginning of the Kinderzenen, or Scenes from Childhood, by Robert Schumann. I really love this music. I know it's not by Bach. That's okay. <laughs> First, you're going to hear me play it with 
uh, stiff arms, stiff wrists, no shock absorbers, no releasing the arms away from the body. And you'll hear that the tone is kind of clenched and tight, not very warm or sweet. I'm going to follow that up with a performance of the same excerpt uh, in which the wrists are working flexibly as shock absorbers and the arms are releasing away from the body. And I'm sure you will hear a difference in the sound. All right, the, so the beginning the, from the first movement of the Kinderzenen by Robert Schumann. Also, we'll put my hand on the keyboard, assuming my hand is the keyboard, like this, drop my wrist down, and raise it. You want to do it from your wrist rather than from your shoulder. I find a lot of students have very stiff, especially adults, their wrists are like marble, granite, you know, just <coughs> so like a, like a rock, a knot. Get, even if you can get just a hint of mobility. And as you play, the movements that we make with the wrist, they're designed to follow the shape of the melody, of, of the, the notes that you're playing. If the notes are going up and you're playing them in your right hand, if I'm going to play a scale, a C major scale in my right hand, so my, at the start of the scale, my upper arm is close to my body. And then the wrist, like the notes are going that way, obviously, right? So the wrist is going to go in conjunction with the shape of the scale, the direction of the notes. And the arm will follow, and so will the, the body, right? Same thing if I'm doing a descending scale in my left hand. And approach from above. Why do we want to approach from above? You'll get a clearer attack. Why do we want the hand loose when it's in the air? So that we can maintain a relaxed hand position. Because if the hand is always clenched, including when it's off the keys, th that is going to build up over time and make for some real tired, tense feelings in your, in your body. We don't want that. You want to be able to play your piano for hours on end and not have any pain and enjoy it too, right? So left hand going down. It's going to the left. You're going to rotate with your, with your wrist and the arm will, f at the forearm and the upper arm as well, the upper body will follow. Now, if it's just two octaves that you're going down, you don't have to shift very much. But if you're going all the way down the keyboard, then you're going to have to really shift a lot and even lift your, your right butt cheek off the bench. If you're playing really low down in the bass of the piano, sit on your left bum cheek and let the right be in the air. Right? And also, you can tuck your left foot under your chair. That gives you more support. Right? And then as you move up, now you may need to use the pedal so you can't take your right foot off the pedal. But again, shift your weight so you're sitting on your right bum cheek <laughs> and the left is in the air. So the shifting of the weight, that's why you want to be not sitting on so much of your chair. The way we sit when, we, when we're at the dinner table, <laughs> bring on the mashed potatoes, right? <laughs> You don't sit like that because then all of your weight is 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 too far back. Again, that that uh, electrical zone where that magic crystal ball is is right here, and you want to be in that space. That is valuable real estate. That's where you gain your most uh, velocity, traction, control, and therefore brilliance of sound, clarity of sound, expression, uh, warmth. Uh, just maximum control 
when you're in that little dome. If you're sitting too upright all the time, you're out of the energy zone. Be in the zone. Oh shoot, I had another analogy. I, you, this is not the one I was thinking of, but I used this analogy recently of a cockpit. I've seen footage of it and it looks like quite a production for the driver to get in there. Or like a, a jockey on a horse, you know? Like, <laughs> it's like crawling into, uh, into a tiny little, little almost like a, a little bubble or a cockpit on a, on a plane. There's not a lot of room there. And once you're in there, like everything has a place. The dials are all reachable and you, you're, you're not moving around, reaching for this and that. You're, you're pretty well focused. Those race car drivers, they have a big job to do. You know, they want to be able to handle the curves well. We don't need to do that when we're in our little Honda Civic, whatever, and we're going to the grocery store. You just sit upright and you make a right, make a left. But elite piano playing, I think, is a lot like elite racing or elite sports. It's like a science, right? That's the kind of thing I'm thinking about at the piano really trying to micromanage every detail so that I can make the most expressive performance that I possibly can. If you are a beginner, well, you're not going to be, nor should you be expected to be thinking about things at that level. But a little ounce of it, yeah, think about it a little bit and it'll help you. And these analogies work for me. I hope that they work for you. Sometimes I get a comment from someone saying, oh, I love your analogies. They work. So <laughs> I'll keep throwing them out there and uh, hope that they are helpful. I'm going to wrap this up. Try some of these things out at your piano. Be kind to yourself. Go slowly. Be patient. Play to enjoy. Uh, I thank you for your comments and your likes. Thank you for subscribing. It's greatly appreciated. And without further ado, I'll say goodbye for now. Happy practicing, stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you again soon for more performances of box music and practice tips. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>